promise originally given to Abraham that one day he would uh, have descendants uh, that just could not be numbered. And a promise was made to his people to bring them to a land that he will show them where they would dwell, where they would live out the purposes of the Lord and, and be in his presence. And we know all of the amazing signs and wonders that were seen in, in the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, to overcome the superpower of the day and deliver them out. And the 42 stops, just provision after provision, miracle after miracle, food from heaven, water from rocks. They saw it with their own eyes, they had a promise. And no doubt, the people longed for the day that it would be fulfilled, no doubt because we can read for ourselves some of the low points where their emunah failed them, when the obstacles in front of them appeared large enough to blot out the light of the promise. You know, I wasn't planning to say this, but it just popped into my head, you know, when you look at the sun, that is a massive, Massive, massive object. Incredibly far away. And immensely powerful. Right? But yet, you can get something the size of your pinky right in your face, and it can block it out. And I think that's, in some ways, what they then and we now experienced and experience is that these tiny problems, tiny in the grand scheme of things, albeit when we can't save the solution to the problem in front of us, can seem immense to the point of blotting out and, and blocking the promise that the Father has made to them then and to us now. Am I the only one that experiences these things? No. Once again, I feel like I'm at a librarian convention. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you're here. Okay, good. And, you know, we know what happens because of not only their lack of faith, their lack of trust in God's word, because really, that's what it is when it comes down to it. God, the Almighty, who presented himself in various manifestations to all of these people. They all saw, they all heard, right? But somehow, not consciously, I imagine, they decided in their heart that, nah, you're not that big. Not big enough for what we face now. Because what happened? They took their eyes off of the one who made the promise, the one who made everything, the one who delivered them out of Egypt, the one who sustained them, the one who provided for them, the one who protected them, the one who, who poured into them everything. Stop looking at him. And what did they look at? They looked at themselves. They saw the giants struck fear into them. But it's interesting what they said. That they said that we appeared as grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so it was to them. The reality is, 
the reputation of the Lord was known. They were likely afraid of the Israelites. Yet, when the enemies of God saw the fear and how little the Israelites thought of themselves and their God, that's when the enemy also saw them as they saw themselves. You know, the reality is if you're, you're born again, Yeshua is alive in you. And if that is true, and you study the word, and you memorize scripture, and that living word is inside of you, sharper than any two-edged sword, you, I'm gonna say something that might surprise you. You are feared by the enemy. Mm -hmm. Or at the very least should be feared. If he's not afraid of you, may I suggest it's not because of uh, the lack of the fact that you're saved and it's not uh, for a, a lack of the power of Messiah. It's, it's for a, a lack of understanding. When we understand who we are in Messiah Yeshua and how great and how awesome he is and how beyond explanation it is that he dwells in us. We are vessels that carry the word. We are vessels that carry the Ruach. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God? Living stones. But the enemy isn't going to fear you if you cower first. Now I say that as a man who's, you know, I'm, I don't consider myself particularly brave and I certainly uh, understand the, uh, the formidable power that Hasatan is. I'm not one to go looking for a fight with a human, much less an entity such as that. However, I have to remind myself, I have had to remind myself today, feeling uh, anxiety starting before service, and I've had to remind myself, no. There's no authority that the enemy has except when we give it to him. Amen. So we've got to wake ourselves up and stand in Amuna on the promises because the one who made the promises is not a man that he should lie. He, he's not weak. His arm is not short. He is awesome and powerful and everywhere. So uh, a question that sometimes comes up with regard to the spies, well, why did, why did Moses send the spies in the first place? Well, why didn't they just go in? Well, verses one through three says that God told Moses to send the spies. Hmm. But for themselves, send for yourselves. <laughs> and scripture interprets scripture, so I wanna show you something. Uh, Interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, who's good at those verses? Come on down, please. So 22 through 32. Uh, Josh, is that right? Say it again. Deuteronomy chapter 1, what? 22 through 32. Two. Okay. Then all of you approached me and said, 
Let us send men before us, that they may search out the land for us, and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and into the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took twelve of your men, one man for each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country, and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied it out. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down to us. And they brought us back a report, and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, do not be shocked, nor fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son, in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God. Josh, what are the other verses besides Romans? That was it. That was it. Okay. All right, so there we have explanation from Scripture, not only from what Monica pointed out, the, the verbiage was send for yourselves. So it, 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 it and that, you know, kind of gets argued back and forth, but the argument gets taken away when you read these Scriptures. The people came to Moses. They wanted to send spies. And interestingly enough, it wasn't, let's, let's go in and see, uh, see if God's you know, telling the truth. They want to go and find the way, which pleased Moses. Yeah, what, what's, what's, what's a good path? Go and see. I mean, it's not like we, you know, we got millions of people, <laughs> right? So, you know, let's find the, uh, you know, a, 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 good, uh, a good spot, a good path, a good way. And uh, I'm going blank if it was in, in, in these verses or from 14. When, and it might have been, might be throwing me because of a different version that I, 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 I read perhaps from you. But one of the explanations that the, the Israelites, the spies, gave was, look, you know, they're, they're men of great stature in fortified cities or walled cities or, uh, or, or you know, high and lifted up kind of thing, depending uh, on, on the exact translation of the Hebrew there. But it says that they, that this, I think it was, they or the cities are in the heavens, are in the sky. Why? Why would they say that? It's an odd thing to say. Was it just a euphemism or just a way for them to explain how big, you know, these things are up to the sky? If you ever been to New York City, and I got an aunt and uncle in New York City, and been there a few times, and if I never go again, I'm cool with that. <laughs> it was kind of fun when I was young, but uh, claustrophobic in a lot of ways. There's too many people in too small an area. But I, I recall that my aunt and uncle lived just a couple of blocks from the World Trade Centers, and uh, I was there in 1999, so a year or so before before the attacks. And uh, it was actually in September as well. September 9th <laughs> was, anyway, you don't need to know why I was there, but I was there. <laughs> My aunt was a, a journalist and an excellent tour guide, but I remember standing and just looking up, and, oh my goodness, they seemed to reach into the heavens. So on one level, it certainly could be argued that, you know, that that's what's happening here. And again, Midrash, you know, storytelling, it's all, they all illustrate, uh, 
various points. We talk often about the facets of a diamond and the one light that comes in and then it gets refracted into all, all the different colors of, of the rainbow and, uh, and is, well, is the, is the blue light correct or the orange correct? Or is the red or the violet? You know, it's, it's all part of the same thing. They'll tell a different, a different side of the story, so to speak. But according to the sages, this gets into something called mazel, the big uh, emphasis of today. A mazel or a mazel, uh, you, you'll hear it uh, usually around time of the celebration. Uh, in the phrase mazel tov, you guys heard that? And typically, it's uh, translated as good luck. Right? Hey, Mazel Tov. Just found out you're with child. Hey, Mazel Tov with the new job. Hey, you know? The thing, though, in Judaism, there's no concept of luck. They don't believe in luck. Luck is not a thing in Judaism. So a Mazel, literally, has to do with uh, a flow or a force. That kind of sounds strange. Good flow, good force. What is that? Is it Star Wars? May, may the force be with you. <laughs> no, that's not what it is. So, this gets into some interesting and strange territory. And if you haven't already looked at this stuff, I don't necessarily recommend you go down this road. But so, the constellations, the most, the the world calls it, you know, zodiac and turns it into an astrology uh, kind of weird, pretty evil, uh, twisted thing. And it's just like the enemy. To take something that God created, to take something that was intended for good and to twist it in a way that it's used for evil, and we certainly know it's used for evil. Um, but we do know for a fact, we can point to scripture that on the fourth day of creation, God created the sun and the moon and the stars for signs and for seasons and for times for the Moedim. And we know that there was a constellation that uh, was pointed to as a sign that they were to look for uh, that pointed towards the, the birth of, of, of the Jewish Messiah long awaited and, and praise God has been fulfilled and, and he came. In Revelation chapter 12, it points to uh, the, the same sign, you know, the, and the virgin clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet. Well, it's talking about the constellation Virgo at sunrise, clothed in the sun, and the moon is positioned at her feet. And it's a sign of what's depicted later in, in, in chapter 12. So the Mazel is I, I look at it, it well, I don't want to look at it to be honest, I don't pay much attention, but I kind of put it in the same category as uh, you've heard me say how the weekly parsha are lined up with certain windows, or doors, gates, portals, whatever you want to call them in the heavenly realm where there's certain lessons for that certain time of the year that give us a heads up as to what's going on and, 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 and what, to, what to be aware of and what to look for. Uh, challenges that come uh, in the form of, you know, schemes of the enemy because everything, everything is cyclical. If he gets you with a certain sin, you know, believe you me, he's taking notes. The date and the time and, you know, circumstances and and uh, when that opportunity comes around again, he's going to try it again. Just keep getting it. If it, if it ain't work, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> I messed that one up. So he, he goes with what, what works. So I kind of think of, of, of it that way. But the important thing is the Israelites recognized that the power or the force of the mazel 
was in their eyes with the inhabitants of the land, that their cities ascended to the heavens, that they were somehow protected by this force or by this flow. And they attributed that to their strength. Does that make sense? Yes. But the problem with that is, and I guess looking at it that way, uh, in my eyes, qualifies what was happening there as astrology, not astronomy, and sinful. Why? Because God, who is over the Moselle, he is over this. He's the creator of them for the love of people. He's not subject to them. He's not at their mercy. They're in their fixed positions in the heavens. At his word. And again, what the Lord meant for good, the enemy took, twisted it, and turned it to evil. Now I want to show you something. Who's got... Um, Romans, uh, Romans, Romans 8, let's do the, the one that's listed first. Romans 8? Yeah. What, what, what verses are it? Romans 1, 8 through 17. Romans 1, 8 through 17. Who had that one? I, I do. Come on down. So, Romans chapter 1. Yep. Yes. Chapter 1, 8 to 17. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, New King James Version. First, I thank my Elohim through Yeshua HaMashiach for you all that your faith, Muna or Pistis in the Greek, is spoken of throughout the whole world. For Elohim is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of Elohim to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual Faith, both of you and me. There. Uh, one more. One more. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I've often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Amen. And Josh, did you have the... 31 to 39? Uh, chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, chapter 8. Chapter 8. going to go to Romans 8, uh, 31 to 39. Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but deliver him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you. So the just shall live by emunah. We 
You shall live by it. You want to be blessed. You want to thrive. You want to fulfill your days upon the earth. You want to be, as Rabbi Cliff used to tell me, when he would tell me about the target on your back when you were in ministry and the enemy is just going to be just relentless. He said, don't sweat it, though. You're bulletproof until it's your time. The enemy can't touch you. He can now throw obstacles in your way. He can, he, he, he can, you know, throw this at you and that at you, but no weapon shall prosper. You cannot overcome, and you cannot even do anything unless the Lord gives permission first. And if he gives permission, it is ultimately for your own good. Romans 8, 28. And Romans uh, 8, 31 to 39 that Josh just read, it, it goes along with Ephesians uh, 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and wickedness enthroned in high places. This is talking about the Moselle. There, there, there is a force out there. There is a flow, if you will, that comes from the prince of the power of the air. And it's real. And it is not good. And it's hard sometimes. And it's scary sometimes. But God... Uh, I feel like being one of those TV preachers. Everybody say, but God. But God, <laughs> but God, God. is the God is it God? That oh, you don't have to say everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're throwing me off here. I'm just kidding. But God is the one who created everything, including those principalities. What do you got to lose? Nothing. So Winston Churchill and that old recording, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I say we don't even have fear to fear. Whom shall we fear? Yeshua says in Matthew 28, don't fear him who can destroy the body and then do no more. That's man, that's principalities, Right? That's wickedness and throne in high places. Don't fear, he says, but fear him who can destroy the body and cast it, cast the soul into eternal hellfire. If we focus our fear properly towards the one to whom it is due, because guess what? If you're going to cow or bat down or, or, or bow down, it, it better only be to God. Nobody else. Why? We've discussed this a hundred times, if we've discussed it once. He wants us to tremble in his presence. He, 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 he gets joy from that now. Deuteronomy 10, 13, he knows that when we fear him, we will walk in his ways, we'll search his word. Once we get past the do's and the don'ts and understand that that's there to show us how much he cares for us, how much he loves us, how much he wants us to be protected, then we love him. Then we'll serve him. And from service, we get to the point where we guard the commands. We put the fences around us, but you shoot with it. Don't even get close. If you hate your brother without cause, you've committed murder already. So murder, do not murder, is the command, right? Yeshua didn't just say, don't murder. He could have. That's what the word said. He said, don't, don't even hate somebody. Why? Because it could lead to the sin. Why then does God allow his people whom he loves Make such bonehead decisions. One of the sages, the Maharel of Prague, kind of put it this way. 
you know, if you want to follow the Lord, the door is open. And he will help us. But likewise, if we want to sin, the door is open. And he will let us. However, he will put obstacles in our way to try to keep us from sinning. He'll put people in our way that'll speak truth. He'll remind us of what the word says on a particular issue. He'll divert you in various ways, but when you get to the point where you are insistent upon the sin, they'll stand aside and allow it. Arimuna must be strong. It must be based on the word. Not on cute little lessons, not on, you know, ideas or fantasies of what, you know, how it should be or could be or what we think or our opinion. Arimuna needs to be based on the word and the word alone. Not someone's revelation of the word or this teaching or that teaching, it, it, it's, it has to be based on the word. When it's based on the word, it's based in truth. The foundation is now sure. When the attack comes or the temptations come, a fear presents itself trying to divert us from the path that we are destined to take because it is what the Lord has set for us. He is the author and perfecter of our Amunah. I like the English translation that says he is the author and the finisher. If God started a good work in you and you're here, I presume he's, he's, he's at least started. And if someone's watching this later on YouTube and, and, and you haven't started, start. Walk with him. Oh, but I can't, I can't this, I can't that. I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. Oh my goodness, you're talking, you know, you, you, if you were to say that to me, you're talking to a blind rabbi for the love of Pete, knock it off. There is no such thing as I can't. I had times in my life where I, I thought it was over. I thought I couldn't do it anymore. I, I, you know, God can't possibly use me now because of what happened and this choice and that choice came came up in my face and 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 according to, to man and man's rules, that's it, you're done, sit down. Thanks for trying. No consolation prize. And for a good part of my life, I feel like, or felt like, I was in the wilderness. I'm trying this, trying that, just do, do a little bit here, a little bit there, and it was the years I ran from the Lord, and, and just, again, out of a, a sense of hopelessness, but there was something in me still in the back of my, my mind that kept reminding me, but God, but God said, but God called you. And then I'd give my yeah buts back. Well, yeah, but the denomination says this, and I can't do that in this, you know, what, what, how am I going to overcome that? Many years later. Probably didn't have to be as many years as it was. Apparently I'm not the uh, brightest bulb in the pack sometimes. Slow learner, but I get there eventually. And he made a way. Why? Because I had a heart to serve him whatever. Didn't have to be anything big or Impressive. It didn't have to be whatever I just wanted to serve. I wanted to get back in a relationship with him. I wanted to, to, to you know, like the old army ads, be all that you can be. I want, 
I don't know what I can be now. I thought, but I'm yours. If anyone can make something out of the mess that I was and am in, in many ways, it's the Lord. And he has been faithful. There, there, it, had you come to me in Bible college when I first started in August of 1990, as a music maker, I was delusional. <laughs> I thought that was uh, my calling. And he told me, hey, you know, in 30 something years, Rabbi of a Messianic congregation, I'm pretty sure I would have slapped you. <laughs> I just laughed and laughed and laughed. But now, I'm here, and it's not because of me. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags before him, and I'm no different. But it's amazing now what God is doing in this congregation and the amazing people that he's bringing. And I've just seen unfold before my very eyes the answer to prayer for the past 10, 11, 12, I don't even know how many years we've, we've been meeting as a group. Started in my, my living room, which back then was a block away from here. And to see what he's doing now. And, and now because of the people that he's bringing here and, and the prayer warriors that we have here and, 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 and website is doing some amazing things. I had a Baptist pastor. Let me say that again. A Baptist pastor found the website and called and had questions on these Jewish feasts. I don't, I don't get it. I want to. I want to understand that. We talked about the fall festivals and their implications of, of end times, uh, things to come, and how they point to being born again. Even and we'll, we'll discuss that as we approach the month of Elul coming up in August. Which so I'll have to teach it beforehand, but <laughs> gotta save that for when it's really gonna count. We had lunch this past Tuesday. He came up uh, to Mooresville, where, where we live, from Lincolnton. And uh, we had a, a two and a half hour lunch that ended in, uh, I'm gonna be going to, to teach. He's having a conference a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and a Wednesday. And uh, the Lord opened the door for me to, to go September 27th, day after uh, Yom Kippur, I'll be teaching at his congregation. And as a funny aside, we're walking down, we uh, got out of his car, and we're walking into the restaurant, and he says, you know, we're one priest away from a really funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I like him already. <laughs> and, then, and, and the Lord is uh, opening doors too I've been able to share with a pastor of a very large church in Concord and, and I'm supposed to uh, be talking with another pastor that's got multiple campuses a pretty neat guy I'm looking forward to it and I say all that to say this back in my mess had I turned back to Egypt had I given up because I put my Imuna in the Moselle of the enemy, none of this would be happening. And it's awesome, it's exciting, it is humbling beyond my ability to express. Because if ever there was a, a, a man uh, inadequate for the task, it is I. But that is just like our God, who takes the weak and the broken vessels, and through our weakness, his strength is made perfect. If you get nothing 
else out of today's message. If you get nothing else out of being part of this congregation, please get this. If God can use Jeff, what can he do with me? The answer is something pretty awesome. We just need to surrender our will to the Father's and learn the lessons of those who were never allowed into the promised land. For lack of a moon. And I'm already seeing some great things in some of you guys stepping up and doing things you didn't think you could do or were uncomfortable doing at first and now it's 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 awesome and i'm excited about the future of this congregation i don't know how much time we have left fall festivals are coming up maybe this is the year we're out of here but i'm not letting that deter me because what if it's not i don't want to lose the time between here and there in glorifying the King and being a part of building his kingdom. And I hope you all are with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in Yeshua's name,